This is episode number 34 with Genevieve Holland. Welcome to the Melissa Ambrosini Show. I'm your host, Melissa, best-selling author of Mastering Your Mean Girl, and I'm here to remind you that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word. Each week, I'll be getting up close and personal with thought leaders from around the globe to uncover the habits, habits, mindsets, mindsets. tools, and rituals that they have used to become world-class so that you can create epic change in your own life and become the best version of yourself possible. Are you ready, beautiful? With over 60 million views on her YouTube channel, Genevieve's funny but incredibly informative videos have empowered millions of women to embrace natural pregnancy and parenting. But Genevieve wasn't always mama natural. Once upon a time, she was a cigarette smoking, junk food junkie. A sugar addict, she was 60 pounds overweight and her health was declining. Through a long road of detox, Genevieve discovered the healing power of real food and natural living. This information spread into every area of her life, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Genevieve gave birth to her two beautiful children in a birth center supported by a midwife and doula. Today, Genevieve is on a mission to help mums and mums-to-be live happier, healthier lives. Along with her husband, Michael, she runs the web's most popular natural pregnancy blog and YouTube channel. Their work has been featured on Dr. Oz, ABC News, The Daily Mail, and so much more. I first came across her work on my beautiful friend Ben Greenfield's podcast, And after that, I immediately got her book and a few days later, it arrived on my doorstep and I devoured it and I thought, I have to share her with you guys. Her YouTube videos are hilarious and they're so incredibly educational. So I am so excited for you to hear from her today. In today's episode, we chat about how she went from being a junk food, soft drink, guzzling smoker to mama natural why fear in birth doesn't have to be your reality, vaginal birth versus cesarean births, the key to a natural birth, what a gentle cesarean is, why you want to have a vaginal swab if you have a cesarean, what a home birth is and versus a hospital birth, the keys for reducing your risk of intervention, The difference between a midwife and a doula and why you want both. How to find your dream birth team. Why you should eat your placenta. This is awesome. Why presence and surrender are key to happiness and blissful births. The three things you must do for healthy humming hormones. Why you want to avoid stressful, strenuous exercise when you're pregnant plus so much more. For everything that we mention in today's episode, you can check out in the show notes and that is at melissaambrosini.com forward slash 34. And now without further ado, I am so excited to bring on the one and only Genevieve Holland, aka Mama Natural. Genevieve, it is so good to have you on the show. Before we dive in, can you please tell us what you had for breakfast this morning? Oh my gosh. Well, it's a pleasure to be here too, Melissa. Let me think back. What did I have? I had some eggs and I had a couple squares of 100% cacao. So I'm a weird person. I like like straight up chocolate bars with no sweetener whatsoever. Uh, So I had that and then I had some um, green tea with ginger. So it's a blend um, and it's so it's very, very low in caffeine. And I think that was it. Mm, Sounds delicious. Straight up chocolate. I love it. Yes. It's really bitter, you know, kind of tastes like espresso, Mm. Uh, you know, just very bitter just it has like a little bit of caffeine and I don't know I just I I also think too it's got some nice fats 
Um, so it's just really satiating. And I actually like to have it in the morning or in the afternoon versus like after I eat dinner or something like that. Just so, you know, it doesn't interrupt my sleep. Great idea. Now, it's very easy for, you know, people from the outside to look at you and think, Mama Natural, okay, it's so easy for her. She has this perfect, healthy life. But you haven't always been a nutrition saint. In fact, there was a time when you were a junk food eating smoker who guzzled down soft drink like no tomorrow. So, can you take us back to how you went from that to being Mama Natural? Yes. Well, I mean, God can do amazing things. That's for sure. Um, it's just, you know, it was such a journey. I think what happened was I was maybe, um, an early bloomer or something like that, uh, in the sense that I just kind of bottomed out really young. And, you know, for me, when I was a little kid, I remember, you know, going to friend's house after school and we'd, you know, have our after school snack. And if it was anything sweet or sugary, it was like one wasn't enough. You know, I always wanted more. And I remember noticing my friends would eat it and just kind of not think twice about it and move on and start playing and, you know, just not be so fixated on it. So from even a very young age, food, but particularly sugar, just had this pull. And uh, so anyway, I just kind of proceeded on and then, you know, got, I got into high school and started, you know, that's when the dieting and the body image stuff comes up and puberty. And, um, and so really, I actually first started more dieting and getting kind of obsessive with exercise. And but again, it was focused on food and trying to control it. And so I did that for a couple of years and got actually very thin, um, like too thin for my frame and everything like that. And then it just... I remember one day I, I was a runner and uh, I had practice after school because I ran on, you know, the school team and I came home and I had my little fat free breakfast, you know, dinner. And I remember thinking I'm starving. And so then I just started overeating and then that really has been more of my experience. So I did that for gosh, the next like six or seven years until I was 23 years old where I was like a binge eater. And at that time, people did not talk about binge eating. They talked about anorexia. They talked about bulimia, but someone who just consumed a large quantity of food, usually, you know, kind of in a short time period and just left it in their system, you know, and didn't purge it in some way. They didn't really talk about that a lot. There wasn't a lot of, um, you know, medical literature or just even people, you know, talking about it. So I felt very alone, very weird, like something was majorly wrong with me. And it was just very isolating. Um, so, uh, you know, I proceeded to do that. And I remember, you know, went away to college and instead of gaining, you know, here the freshman 15, I gained like the freshman 40 um, because college was kind of like, you know, the food was available 24 seven at the cafeteria and it was all sugar and starch. Um, and finally when I, you know, I was, like I said, I was 23 years old and I was in my largest pants. I couldn't even button them. And I had binged, you know, all day. And I remember my last meal, I called it like my last supper was a supersized McDonald's meal. So it was like a Big Mac and supersized fry and like a large, you know, extra large. It was a Diet Coke, which is so funny. Uh, and then like a McFlurry or something. And I remember I came home and it was actually New Year's Eve and all my friends had gone out. Even my parents went out. I was literally was home with the family dog. And I just, it was like this sole decision where I'm like, I cannot do this anymore. Like this is literally killing me. Not only, you know, physically, but just emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Um, it was just so painful, you know, to wake up the next morning and to feel bloated and just, disgusted at, you know, what I had eaten and stuff like that. So that was really my bottom. And so January 1st of 1999, I just was like, I will do anything to not overeat. So I went to a nutritionist and she helped me put together like a food plan. I went, I started going to support groups for people that had, you know, different compulsive eating um, issues. And I just started, it was literally like one meal at a time, just you know, recovering basically from that kind of addiction. And so fast forward, it's been 18 years and I've not had white refined sugar. Um, I would say, uh, intentionally because I'm definitely sure I've gone out to eat and you know what I mean? You can't control every single ingredient, 
that's put into food, but in terms of sugary desserts, refined, you know, junk food, candy bars, that sort of thing, Coca-Cola, I have been free of that. And it's truly by God's grace and, you know, just taking it, you know, just, I think it becomes a lifestyle, like just how overeating was my lifestyle for so many years. Once you start not overeating and once you take away, for me, sugar is such a trigger that once I took it out of my diet, that helped enormously. And then just learning like better coping skills, you know, with life and everything like that. And then it becomes your new lifestyle. And then the idea of going out and like binging on ice cream or whatever seems so foreign because we've had so many months and years of not doing that. So yeah, so that was my journey. And I lost 60 pounds like in a year and I've pretty much kept it off. I mean, I've had two babies and stuff like that. I mean, that was also when I was 23. I'm 40, I'm almost 42. So, but yeah, I mean, it's a tremendous gift and I'm always grateful just not to live in that house. So. so how did this then turn into all of the birthing stuff that you do? So how long were you on this path for before you really wanted to get your body baby ready? Okay. So I was 23 when I got clean with the sugar. And then I really, I didn't get married till I was 32. And it wasn't until I was 34 that I got pregnant with my son. And my mom, I grew up with, you know, obviously my mom and she had two C-sections. Um, and I remember always seeing her scar. It was very large. This is back in the day when they did the, the surgery different. And so it literally went from like her pelvic bone up to almost her sternum. And I always, you know, I, I remember one time I was like, is that a shark bite? Like I had no idea what it was and what it was from. And so she's like, no, this is how you came out of me, you know, through, in my belly. And this is, it was a cesarean. And so she explained it to me and stuff like that. But I always remember looking at that being like, I would like to avoid that if I could. Um, but I also knew from my mom's experience that she would not have probably made it. It hadn't been for C-sections. So C-sections definitely are needed. They save lives. And if we're not seeing enough C-sections in certain populations, you actually start to worry that there's, you know, high uh, rates of death, you know, because it's just not possible for every single woman to have a natural vaginal unmedicated birth. Um, but anyway, so I remember seeing that being like, I don't want to do that. So when I got pregnant, I remember thinking, okay, I, I would like to not have a C-section if I could. Um, I'm not big into doctors and hospitals and all that kind of thing. So I started doing some research like I do with everything else. And really just, you know, I got clean with the food. Then I started getting clean with my cleaning supplies and my makeup. And it kind of becomes a ripple effect. So it makes sense that I was thinking, okay, how could I do this more natural or cleaner or without all the drugs and things like that. So I started doing research. A big turning point was watching The Business of Being Born. It's a phenomenal uh, documentary by Ricky Lake. And it really opens up your eyes to the business and to kind of the cascade of interventions and what we can do to kind of empower and educate ourselves to try to steer our birth in a different way. Um, so that's really how it began. And then I you know, found a midwife. There's a really awesome midwife group um, in a suburb of Chicago where I lived at the time. And so they were a great support and I got a doula. And before I knew it, you know, I was going towards this road of having a natural childbirth. And so that's kind of how this all came to be. And then going through my two births and having them be so radically different, I really fell in love with not only pregnancy, but the birth process, the bonding, the breastfeeding, that whole time in a woman's life is so miraculous and precious and special that that's really what my mission and my, um, my focus is and my community and how I like to support people is in that whole area, that time of someone's life. So. Yeah, there's a lot of fear around birth, you know, and when people talk about it or the actual labor, you know, they use the word scary or painful or contractions and there's so much fear. But if you look at um, the business of being born or the work of um, – there's another documentary called Birth Into Being um, and, you know, beautiful Instagrams like Graceful Birth, you can see that there is another way. Absolutely. You know, it's a very normal biological process and yet, you know, it's miraculous, but it's very ordinary. You know, it's um, the body knows what to do. And in most cases, and so, yeah, it's about returning to that, returning to that ancient wisdom. Women have been giving a birth for millennium. This is, um, 
We don't have to make it so complicated. We don't have to make it so medicalized in many circumstances, you know, and thank God we do have the interventions that we do. Um, but we don't have to lead with that. And I think what was really eye opening for me, I was an early bloomer, maybe with my <laughs> road of healthy living, but not so much with like getting married and having kids. I was later in life compared to my friends. And I remember one afternoon I went out to lunch with like six of my high school friends and I was thinking about getting pregnant and stuff like that. And so I just kind of wanted to know, you know, what their journeys were like with their births and stuff like that. Cause frankly, I don't think I really asked them that much about it because I wasn't pregnant and wasn't even married, I think, at the time. But anyway, after talking to them, I think five out of six of them had C-sections. There was only one of my friends that gave birth vaginally. And that really just shocked me. Like, wow. And for most of them, it was a very predictable pattern where they got to their due date. They did not go into labor, which, by the way, it's very uh, rare that a woman, whether it's her first or her fifth baby, would give birth on the due date. But especially with a first time mom, they tend to go late, about a week and a day late. Um, so anyways, they got to their due date. They weren't in labor. So the doctor induced them and you know, their body and the baby was probably not ready to give birth at that time. And so the body maybe resisted that induction. And so they were given Pitocin and different things to encourage contractions and, you know, for the labor to progress. It was super intense, super painful. And so they requested an epidural to help manage that pain. And then the epidural kind of depressed the contractions and the progression of their birth. And then after about 24 hours, they're labeled, you know, failure to, you know, um, proceed or to fa- failure of progress, I think is what it's called. And then they get an emergency C-section, they call it, which it really isn't truly emergency, emergency C-section unless the health of the mom or the baby is like acutely, you know, in danger. And that was really their, most of my friend's journey. And that is a medically managed birth, you know, when it goes bad, you know, so um, that really inspired me too to do, again do my research and see what's wrong with the way things are going on right now um, and the way birth is being handled. And the good news is, I do think the tides are changing. You know, more and more studies are coming out about the benefits of vaginal birth, about the benefits of even a mom attempting to give birth vaginally is beneficial um, for the baby and for the mom. Um, and so these, I, you know, the idea of inducing or having a scheduled cesarean, um, those are becoming a little bit less frequent and more doctors are seeing the benefits of, you know, natural vaginal childbirth of they've revised even the dates of, you know, when a baby is quote unquote due, um, because some doctors were inducing at 38 and 39 weeks and now that's, you know, not happening. So I feel like things are changing, which is good. For me, I mean, I have a stepson, so I have never given birth. So I I don't know, you know, I'm only speaking from my experience of what I have witnessed, but it seems absolutely ludicrous to me that you would get hung up on a particular date. Like your body has an innate intelligence and is so incredibly intelligent that why would we go and mess with when it, you know, and induce? Like, I mean, of course, there are some circumstances where it's absolutely needed, but I feel like we as women need to trust our bodies even more. Trust, you know, not just when we're actually giving birth, but trust that our bodies know exactly what they're doing and they are so intelligent. Like, just think about how much we heal and how we can heal a scar and things like that. Like, I just look at the body. Like, every month when I get my moon, I'm just in awe of my body and and what it does. And I just love my body so much. And I think trust is a big word during pregnancy and childbirth. But I would love to hear your thoughts on, and I love that you said that a lot of doctors are coming around to understanding the importance of vaginal birth now. I think that's really important. So, can you talk to us about the difference between a vaginal birth and a C-section? And obviously, there are times where, like you mentioned, C-sections are 
totally necessary if if the mother or the baby is in great danger. Um, but there are a lot of times where it could have potentially been avoided. So, can you just tell us a little bit of the difference between them and what your baby is going to miss out on if you do have a C-section? Well, you know, and, and talking about things also changing, there's a new um, process called a gentle cesarean, which kind of helps to recreate some of the benefits of natural childbirth. But yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. The biggest thing um, for babies is as they're going down the you know birth canal, they are picking up bacteria. You know what I mean? They are picking up, they are inoculating basically their microbiome um, from their mom's you know vaginal um, cavity. So this is huge. And if you look at studies, they're showing that babies that are born via C-section have higher rates of things like asthma, allergies, diabetes, um, even arthritis, cancer, um, inflammatory bowel disease. And, you know, some practitioners believe that all disease begins in the gut. And that's where, you know, C-section babies do not get that benefit. And so I think that is the biggest thing in terms of a vaginal birth. Um, the other thing is, Recovery for mom is going to be a lot easier, uh, in the, generally speaking, when she gives birth vaginally. I remember when I gave birth, it was like, literally, I popped out my baby and like 10 minutes later, we're eating Mexican food and I'm walking around, you know, and I couldn't believe how my body just kind of felt great after giving birth. Um, if we have, you know, a C-section, you have, you know, an incision, you've got scars, you have um, soreness. And you also have some um, lack of movement, you know what I mean, in terms of holding baby, carrying baby, moving around, getting up. Are you bedridden for a little while as well? Um, you can be. It depends. You know, you definitely have limited mobility. Um, so certain things, you, you're, you're um, also advised not to lift anything heavier than your baby. Um, coming up from like a laying position to a sitting position can be very tricky. Um, so you know, it's definitely more of a recovery for most moms. Um, you also sometimes don't get that great endorphin rush because um, as, it depends on really how your birth goes, but the more you're pushing, the more you're in deep labor, labor the more you're um, contracting, your body is surging with oxytocin and you're getting those wonderful feel-good hormones. Your baby is benefiting from that. And um, after your baby is born, that skin-to-skin -skin contact also helps to increase those hormones. And you both are just, those are like the love hormones. Those are the bonding hormones. So you guys are both kind of in that euphoria post-birth. It's kind of like this magical hour after giving birth. And unfortunately, with a lot of C-sections, the way they're done Currently, it's like they whisk the baby off, they wash them, they clean them, they wrap them, you know, and mom is being sewn up and she might not see her baby for another hour or so. Um, so that is always obviously another um, detriment. Also, in terms of breastfeeding, because there's not that early contact between baby and mom and that skin to skin contact, um, breastfeeding can be delayed. And there have been studies that show that mom's um, you know, whose babies were born via C-section aren't um, breastfeeding as long with their babies or there's a little bit, um, the exclusive breastfeeding isn't there like it is with the vaginal births. Um, so that's another thing. And breastfeeding is such a wonderful, um, you know, food, obviously for baby. It also helps with their microbiome. I mean, we want to keep that going as long as possible because of all of its wonderful immune properties and it just helps baby seal his gut. Um, it's just fantastic. So that obviously is another, um, you know, benefit of a vaginal birth. Um, but I would really would say, and I think also just emotionally, and I, I don't know if a lot of um, moms or people talk about this, I guess doctors, um, emotionally, I think for women to go through, especially if they had to go through labor and it ended up with a cesarean and all of a sudden their birth becomes very medical. If they go into a sterile operating room, no one's allowed to go in there with them potentially, or maybe just their partner. And everything becomes something that started as like, okay, this is miraculous. We're going to do this. And there's this excitement and you're pushing and to kind of more serious and, you know, very um, medicalized, I guess is the best way to put it. 
something um, can happen to mom's just feeling of self-confidence, of her feeling of accomplishment, of, you know, many moms might be trying for a vaginal birth and they don't, um, you know, aren't able to have that. So also I think just with self-esteem, with um, feeling like they accomplished this, that they did it, you know, there is a feeling of, I don't know, just joy in having a vaginal birth. Um, so that also can be a side effect where um, moms can just feel emotionally disappointed or in grief. So it's really important that they get support because like we've talked about so many times in this podcast, it's not always possible to have a vaginal birth. Um, but the good news is there um, is that gentle cesarean, like I talked about, it's only being practiced in like less than 1% of hospitals, but you always can request it. You always can educate your doctor, your hospital, your midwives about this practice. And it really helps to recreate a lot of these benefits. So for example, there's a clear drape that's used instead of, you know, blocking off vision. So mom could actually be a participatory, you know, person in her birth. She actually can witness it. Um, another thing that's really beneficial about vaginal birth is it, um, because as the baby goes through the birth canal, you know, his lungs are literally being squeezed, all those fluids, you know, he's been laying in a sack of fluid, you know, for nine months. And so all those fluids that get built up into his lung tissue are able to be pushed out as he's literally being pushed out of mom. And so something that they recreate with a gentle cesarean is they do the incision, but then they literally let the baby kind of work their way out of mom's belly. Um, so that's really, and it helps to kind of, you know, release some of those fluids. So that's really a neat thing about the gentle cesarean. The other thing is once baby, um, they also move a lot of like, you know, the baby monitoring um, that they do, the IV, they move it into places where it doesn't um, get in the way of mom's movement and also mom's ability to see her baby. Um, and then once the baby is born, um, they go immediate skin to skin. And so mom is able to initiate breastfeeding right away. Um, she's able to bond with her baby and just connect. And then the doctor will do literally be doing the incision as mom and baby are bonding. So that's really cool. There's also something called a vaginal swab, which is super new, um, kind of cutting edge or whatever. But basically what they do is they take a swab of mom's vagina cavity and they swab it into either the baby's mouth or onto um, the mom's breasts if they're breastfeeding. Um, and this helps the baby get some of that inoculation of the bacteria. It helps them start seeding their microbiome. So that has a ton of potential and it's actually really exciting. So I'm you know looking forward to seeing more and more. They've only done a couple studies on it and, you know, uh, testing with it. So I'm looking forward to that being blown out more and being investigated more because, you know, to me, it's like, like I said, C-sections happen, but let's try to optimize them as best as we can and try to bring in as much as we can of the benefits of the way, you know, of natural birth, um, that are both beneficial for mom and for baby. Uh, so yeah, so there's always hope, you know, and that's why I love the gentle cesarean. Mm, that's the first time I've heard of that. It's very interesting. So let's talk about home birth versus having a baby in a hospital. Sure. Um, home birth. I love home birth. I think it's phenomenal. Um, for low-risk women, it is a great place to give birth. And it's really such a personal decision. So that's really something that a mom's going to have to determine working with her healthcare provider and um, find what works best for for her. And that's the thing that's so cool because we teach a birth course and there's like hundreds of different women and it's so neat to meet all of them and to hear their different stories. And I feel like with all of them, it's almost like mom just has an innate sense of where she's supposed to give birth. So whether that's a hospital, a birthing center or home, she kind of will gravitate towards that just naturally. And usually the providers are online and they're all kind of like in sync, which is really cool to see. Occasionally you'll see situations where that's not the case, but I feel like uh, most moms just have a gut feeling of where they want to give birth. For me, I gave birth in a birthing center. It was kind of the Goldilocks, like the in-between, you know, and I think I was a little nervous because my mom did have surgical births that something might happen. And so this way I felt a little bit more supported. I think especially for a first time mom, a birth center is a wonderful um, option because, you know, it's a little bit more, um, they might have more equipment and, you know, birth balls and squatting stools and birthing bars and huge tubs and different things and tools that she can use that she might not have at her home. 
um, but it's not as medicalized as a hospital. So those are also a wonderful option. And really, you know, studies have shown that home birth and birthing center births are very safe. And in some cases, they're actually safer than hospital births. There's less interventions. There's less percentages of C-sections. Um, the babies fare better. The moms fare better. Now, of course, some of that is because most of those births are going to be more low risk. But, I mean, it's gotten to the point where there are, like, major medical organizations actually recommending or supporting midwife, you know, births are births, midwife births or home births. So that's the thing about also a birthing center is that that is run by midwives. So you would not have an OBGYN at a birthing center. They'd have to be transferred. And, um, and that's another thing, like the transfer rates are very low, first of all. And second of all, of the moms that are transferred to a hospital, um, the majority of those cases are because the mom at that point is like, I can't do this anymore. I need an epidural or she wants relief. You know what I mean? So it's more of that versus like a true emergency. Um, but you know, there's some other things to consider, like how far is your home from a hospital? You know, a good rule of thumb is to be 20 minutes away of driving, you know, less than that's even better. You know what I mean? So you have to look at the full picture. Um, and also like, is your home, like, for example, we lived like in this tiny little apartment and, well, actually, it wasn't that small, but it was just, it was in a place where I'm like, I couldn't see myself like moaning and grunting. There was a lot of people around. It was kind of in a very urban environment. I just did not feel safe and comfortable. And that's really what's so important when mom is giving birth. Because if you think about it, like in the wild, if a mammal is giving birth, they're going to pick a place that's dark, safe, quiet, um, tucked away and um, just cozy, right? And so that's, again, where a lot of hospitals, it's fluorescent lighting, it's, you know, hard tables that you're laying on. Um, it is <clears throat> lots of beeping, lots of people prodding you, lots of cuffs and, you know, interventions and things like that. And it's not an environment that allows the body to relax and for the body to do hormonally what it needs to do. It starts to kind of, in fact, work against labor because it kicks in the adrenaline and some of the more like stress response hormones. So um, the best you can recreate that, the better. So if your home is the situation where you feel safe and you can create that environment and it's a low risk pregnancy, that would, could be great. Um, if you feel like a birthing center, you know, a lot of birthing centers, they've got cozy beds, they've got, you know, all these wonderful homey, you know, tools and they have refrigerators so you can have your food and you can eat and you can drink during labor. Um, versus a hospital. But some hospitals do have nice birthing suites. And I know a lot of moms who have to give birth in hospitals for various reasons. And they end up going into the bathroom and like literally turning off the lights. And just that's kind of their little cave. And they do great. Um, so wherever mom is going to feel supported, safe is really the best place for her to give birth. Mm. So you don't need an obstetrician to deliver your baby. You can, a midwife does that. And if you say you had a home birth, the midwife would be there to deliver the baby. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Yes. In fact, like I said, midwife births, I mean, the studies show like they are phenomenal. I mean, it's for low risk pregnancies, they are actually safer than um, working with the OBGYN in terms of outcomes. So you absolutely can work with the midwife. Um, you know, OBGYNs are really surgeons. So they are phenomenal at, you know, surgical birth. And that's really what they um, what they are specializing in, so to speak. There are also family doctors that can deliver babies. Um, so it does, you know, it can you also can have a doctor. They tend to be more holistically minded too. And don't get me wrong, there's some phenomenal OBGYNs out there. And they deliver babies naturally all the time. So, you know, this is it's not to pan doctors or anything like that, because I think they're amazing too. But midwives for low risk pregnancy, midwives, I think are, you know, the way to go if you really want a natural childbirth, because that's really what they're trained. And even in your prenatal visits and stuff like that, they they look at the person holistically and they talk about nutrition and they talk about different ways to um, support yourself, your body, exercise. So they look at all the different factors because if you have a good diet when you're pregnant, if you're exercising regularly, if you're getting good sleep, if you're do doing certain things, um, you know, keeping a low sugar diet, maybe boosting your probiotic intake, you can reduce so many interventions. 
you know, when it comes to like gestational diabetes or preeclampsia or um, what's the other one, GBS positive. Now, there is some research that shows that like preeclampsia might have nothing to do with diet and weight and stuff like that, that it can really be um, more of the way the placenta is formed and stuff like that. But the point is, there's a lot you can do uh, preventatively when you're pregnant that can help support a low intervention natural birth. And that's really where midwives shine because that's their orientation. That's their desire for you as well um, is to have, you know, a low intervention birth. So I absolutely recommend midwives for birth. Mm, they're beautiful people as well. My mom is a nurse and a midwife. She doesn't practice midwifery anymore. She has been doing it, you know, since she was 20 years old and she's in her, you know, her late fifties now. And midwives are very special people. They're very beautiful, open, giving supportive people and um I can't recommend them enough because my mom's one <laughs> absolutely we just got back from a midwife conference and I you know it's just they do amazing work and they are on the front lines and they are just so pro women pro birth pro baby pro nurturing I mean they're just yeah I can completely agree they they're amazing I have to just give a shout out to doulas too, because the thing about midwives, you know, I remember when I was giving birth, first of all, if it wasn't for my doula, I would have gone into the hospital and I would have been like, or I'm sorry, into the birthing center at like one centimeter or something, because it was so intense. And I'm like, I've got to be like five centimeters dilated. I just know that I am. And I talked to my doula and she's like, honey, you need to hang up, get in the bath and just relax. It's going to be a long road. Um, so doulas are phenomenal. They are um, just great helpers and they really are going to be with you the majority of your birth or more of your birth than a midwife will be actually. So can you talk to us about the difference between a midwife and a doula and the benefits and do you need both? For people who are formulating their birth team, so to speak, you know, what's the difference and do we need both? Yes, that's a great question. So yes, you definitely need both. Doulas cannot deliver babies. They're not medical professionals. They can't give medical advice. They are really there for emotional, mental, you know, even spiritual support, basically. So, um, but they are experienced with birth, you know, so depending on whom you work with, they have seen most types of births. They are familiar with the way it goes with different tools and tips and tricks that can help you with positioning, you know, different poses as you're laboring, um, you know, just different things that you can do to help ease some of the discomfort. Um, they help, you know, they'll do a little bit of massage while you're laboring. They get, you know, heating packs or ice packs or encourage you to get in the water. I mean, they just know the rhythm of birth and they are like your cheerleader and your support system and your just kind of like they've got your back. And I think, you know, a lot of times husbands might think, well, that's my job or that's my role. But to have kind of an independent party that's not enmeshed in the love relationship and in the parenting of the child, you know, that's going to be coming uh, and entering the land, so to speak, um, is really beneficial. And they actually help the partners become uh, freer to really support their, their laboring, you know, partner. And, um, so they're phenomenal. I highly recommend it. They've been associated in studies with lower interventions, you know, better outcomes, um, more, uh, like a better emotional response from the mom. I mean, so they are definitely evidence-based, um, and I just recommend them. I cannot recommend them highly enough. So doulas are someone that you definitely would hire, but you also obviously need to have a midwife to help you deliver the baby. How do we go about finding the right doula and midwife for us? Is it like a personal experience? Do you want to look at their resume? How do we go about that? Do you want to look at how many babies they've delivered? Like, how did you find yours? Yes, that's a great question. Um, we actually, in our book that we um, published, have a whole like back section with interview questions. So you definitely want to interview your midwife. But I would say, you know, basically it starts probably with a Google search, right? You look up midwives in your local area. 
Um, you also can go to various websites and look up, you know, accredited midwives. And I, again, that's in our book. Um, also word of mouth. You know, most of us have friends that have had babies. Some of them might have done it naturally or with a midwife. So that's always phenomenal to get those, you know, impressions and recommendations. And then it's really just about visiting the offices, meeting with them. And it's kind of a gut feel, you know, is this a good fit? It's like a chemistry thing. Um, just like it is, you know, with picking your partner or something like that. So, um, you meet with your midwife and you see if it's a good fit and you ask them certain questions and, you know, cause some midwives are going to be way on the, you know, crunchy side, so to speak, or ultra natural or ultra, you know, I don't know what the right word is, but just very low intervention based and, um, and other midwife groups are a little bit more conservative and they recommend vaccines during pregnancy and, um, they're okay with Tylenol, you know, different things like that. So you want to be sure that you ask various questions to see that you're in line, you know, philosophically with their practice. And, um, and then again, like I said, it's a gut feeling and the same thing with a doula. So basically the first thing is to really pick your midwife. And then from there, she should have recommendations on doulas, on acupuncturists, on chiropractors, or any other kind of support that you want during pregnancy. Um, and then just check them out. And, you know, with my doula, you know, I had several interviews with different doulas. We just met at like a Starbucks chatted for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. It doesn't take long and you can just tell if it's a good fit or not. Um, but I also would encourage moms to think about the, the one thing about a midwife is a lot of times they're part of a group. And so you don't know for sure who you're actually going to get. So it's a little bit harder to get like too attached to one particular midwife because you could end up getting the other midwife when you actually go into labor. Um, but like I said, a doula is really with you earlier and longer than a midwife is. So that actually is very important that there's a good chemistry. And so I encourage moms to think about like other times in their lives when they've been stressed or they've been, um, you know, you know, overworked or fried. You know what I mean? You know, those times where you're just like, I am losing it. Or like you, maybe you're cramming for your exams or whatever in your life that, you know, you've been at that kind of that brink of yourself. What encourages you? Are you the kind of person that wants someone to come and like squeeze your back and be like, you've got this or give you a hug? Or are you more the type of person that wants really quiet and soothing and gentle, you know, um, reassurance or do you want more of a coach type who's like you've got this let's do this you know and so think about that and try to you know find a, a doula that kind of fits that because that's what birth is like it's intense you know it's probably going to be the hardest marathon of your life so to speak and so think about what encourages you when the going gets tough and try to find someone that kind of fits that bill mm, this is all such amazing advice and um just so great. So, so great. I have started reading a book and I absolutely love it and um, devoured all of your hilarious YouTube videos. I love that you bring such light to this often known serious fear-based topic. So, I'm really grateful that you have done all of that with your husband. But I would love to hear now about eating your placenta. Okay. So I have known about this for many years. It's something that I absolutely want to do. And I went over to one of my best friend's house the other day and she had the most beautiful natural home birth. And she had her midwife, her doula and a photographer there. They're a team of three. They work as a team of three. And um, she had a beautiful birth. And afterwards, she said, yeah, and we're just cleaning up. And they, you know, well, they were cleaning up. She was just holding the baby. And um, then we had placenta smoothies. And I was like, what, wait, wait, wait a minute. You you had what? And she's like, yeah, yeah, they made us a placenta smoothie. So um, I've heard about a lot of people having it in a smoothie, but more so encapsulating it. And so can you tell us the difference between having it in a smoothie as opposed to dehydrating it and encapsulating it and what that does for the mum? Um, so yeah, a raw placenta smoothie is pretty hardcore. Um, and not many moms do that, but I think that's awesome. I mean, if that's what she wanted to do, you know, go for it. Um, 
in terms of like how the micronutrients and the coenzymes and the hormonal profile, I don't know. I don't know if there's been enough research. I mean, this is actually kind of a newer practice, even though, um, you know, the placenta has been very revered in cultures. Um, it's been, um, there's been more attention around it versus like in the U S and in many countries where they just throw it away as medical waste. Um, but in terms of really like studying the effects of placenta and consumption, we really don't have a lot of data on it. Um, but we did, there was one small study that did show that women who have done it don't regret you know, having done it, if that makes sense. And what I always tell moms about placenta encapsulation or placenta consumption, stuff like that, is it's, you always can stop, you know what I mean? So if you start drinking the placenta smoothie and at halfway through, you're like, this is disgusting or I'm done or whatever, then you just stop drinking it. Or if you're taking the capsules and after a week or something, you're like, I feel engorged, enraged and weepy. And I don't like it, you know, then stop taking the pills. Um, but if you don't do it, then you never know, you know, what it would have been like. Um, and I'll be honest with my first pregnancy, the idea really didn't appeal to me. And so I didn't, I just was like, okay, I'm going to have my baby and that's it. But between the time I had my son Griffin and my daughter Paloma, I had heard so many testimonials from moms in my community who in previous pregnancies struggled with postpartum depression, baby blues, low breast milk supply, um, low energy, weakness, uh, fatigue, and how all of these symptoms, you know, for some of them, like magically disappeared from, you know, consuming their placenta. Um, also, you know, mammals in the wild, many of them consume their placenta after giving birth. Now, some of that could be because they want to hide any evidence for predators. Um, but there could be some, you know, wisdom to that um, because obviously giving birth, you know, creating life and all that is a lot of toll on a mom's body. And, you know, placenta, just like any type of organ, like liver meat and stuff like that is very nutrient dense. Um, so anyway, to answer your question, you could eat it raw. Um, you can do the encapsulation. That's a lot more popular and common. And that's where it's actually steamed and then it's dried and then it's pulverized. Um, you also can encapsulate raw placenta powder too. Um, so that's another option. If you like the idea of raw, you know, with the coenzymes and, you know, maybe some more, you know, living qualities, I'm not hundred percent sure. Like I said, there hasn't been a lot of studies done on that. That is another option, but just like any raw, you know, product, there can be, you know, potential issues with that too. Um, so it's really, again, a personal decision. There's also moms that have made placenta truffles. Um, when I had my placenta encapsulated, she made like certain amount of capsules. I can't remember how many, but then she also made a tincture for me of leftover placenta that she mixed with like an alcohol. Um, and she said, you know, you could use this when you go into menopause and different things like that. So, um, yeah. So I hope that answered your question. I just find it so fascinating. I have another one of my friends who encapsulated her placenta and she said it was a lifesaver for um, postnatal depression. She really struggled with it. And then when the capsules came and she started taking them, it really helped her. But then, you know, you listen to your story and you just intuitively knew that it didn't feel good for you. And I think, you know, it comes back to with everything, with pregnancy and birth and um, everything. It's about intuitively listening to your innate wisdom within and trusting that your body and you know what is right for you. And it's about putting on mute everyone else's opinions and the noise outside and really tuning in. Yeah, because it's like you can read studies. I'm sorry if I interrupt you there. Um, but you can read studies about like the benefits of coffee, the benefits of red wine, the benefits of yada, yada, yada. But if you're someone that when drinks a cup of coffee is shaking and, you know, anxious – that's not a good fit, you know? And so, like you said, I love how you're talking about honoring your body, your process and listening to your intuition. That's what it's about. Mm, that's how I live my life. You know, it, I very rarely um, seek external 
advice because I always want to sit and go within first. And then, and then if I'm still perplexed, you know, I will seek outside advice, but you know you better than anyone else. And education is absolutely key. And that's why I love your book. I think everyone needs to read your book. It's, it's, it is just imperative for every single female, whether you're thinking of having a baby now or, you know, in 10 years time, it doesn't matter. This book is just imperative for all women to get their hands on. But then, you know, read it and then tune in with yourself and go, okay, well, that resonates, that doesn't, what feels good for me? This is this is exactly how I live my life, how I make every single decision. And when you strengthen your intuition, you know, you become more connected with yourself and then essentially with your baby as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's going to serve you so well, Melissa, when you're pregnant. I mean, to have that already is phenomenal. So, because birth is a very inward journey. Um, it almost reminds me, like I've never, obviously, it, how do I explain this? But in some ways it reminds me of death or something like that. It's something that in some ways is a very solitary experience for the mom because it's so intense and it's such a passage and it's so internal in some ways and you can have all the support and all the love and all the, um, you know, medical technologies and different things like that. But it really is like you facing yourself in such an intimate way. And of course your creator and your baby, and it's, it's such a beautiful thing. So the fact that you already have that going for you and it's such a strong way is going to serve you so well. Thank you. And there is essentially a part of you that is dying in order for a new part to be reborn, to blossom and to grow. And I have had many friends who have really, really struggled mourning their old self. And then I've had other friends who have just gone for it and just loved and embraced this new chapter in their life and the new person that they are. Um, but then I've had others that have really struggled with that identity and that part of themselves that they feel like is dying. So what would you say to those women that maybe are going through that? Well, first of all, there is nothing wrong with that. You know, I think we can put a lot of judgments like, oh, we shouldn't love this process. We should love being pregnant. We should love a newborn. And that's just not the case for many people. So I think the first thing is not to judge your experience and to accept it and to embrace it. And to also know that um, it's a journey. Motherhood is such a journey and there are stages and phases and it passes and it, it evolves and you change and your children change. So I think I think the more work you can do before you get pregnant around your identity, around your concepts of motherhood, around your relationship with your own mother, around your relationship with your body. You know, I love how you say that when you get your moon, first of all, I think that's such an awesome way of putting it, um, that you are like, this is so awesome. This is like a miracle. And that's how I feel too, because when I got super skinny, there were years where I didn't get a period. And so for me, when I get my period, I'm just like, you know, now I'm 42 and I'm like still getting like when I get on the 28th day. I'm just like, oh, because it's such a miracle to me. I'm like, thank you, body, that you can do this cyclical thing every single month um, for years and years and years. And um, so looking at that relationship even, and I think also just from a physical standpoint, how are your periods? You know, do they come, you know, pretty uneventfully, you know, or is there a whole week of bloat and cravings and rages and acne and, you know, um, headaches or, you know what I'm saying? So you, I I think our period, I think women, as women, we are actually really blessed with a monthly cycle because in some ways it's a little microcosm of what's going on internally with our bodies. Um, And if our cycles are on a a consistent rhythm, if they come and go and it's not that difficult and, um, you know, it just kind of clicks along, that's a good sign of your overall vitality, of of your hormonal balance. So those can be, be a wonderful window into kind of your experience of pregnancy and of birth 
and breastfeeding and stuff like that. It can be, you know, there can definitely be a correlation. So um, I think any work that a mom can do even before she gets pregnant is phenomenal. Um, but if a mom didn't end up doing that or just is in a place where she thought she was going to love being a mom and she has her baby and she's like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. That's okay. So I would say get support, talk to people. Um, don't judge yourself. Know that this is part of normal too. And I think the biggest thing is not to isolate herself and not to beat herself up. Those are the worst things that she can do in those situations. Um, and you know, like I said, seeing the bigger journey, because when you're in the midst of sleep deprivation and getting up three, four times a night and, you know, having very little freedom and very, you know, little social life, it can feel hard sometimes and really intense. And especially if you're more of a free spirit and you loved to be independent and travel and work and whatever your pre baby life was like, um, but also know that it does pass. You know, my children now are three and six and my husband and I marvel at how we're like, we can see little glimpses of a day where we're not going to be that big of a deal in our kid's life. You know what I mean? They're going to kind of be like, Hey mom, what's up? I'm out of here. You know, like it's in, in the scheme of things, the window where we're really influencers and we're really the main caregivers and, um, support for our children is actually small, you know, because as they get more and more into the world and they're going to school and they're engaging with friends and peer groups and extracurricular activities and their love interests and stuff, their world will just continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so will yours. Mm. I agree. And that window is very small, isn't it? You got to savor every moment and just be totally present and soak it up and enjoy it. Yes. Yes. I actually love this book. I, I can't remember the name of it. It's like 365 or something like that. And it's this little journal. And I think it comes in three years. So it's like a tiny, it almost looks like a little prayer book or something like that. And it has three years in it for each page. And it's literally like three or four lines. And it's just about writing one little memory, one little thing that happened, one little tidbit of the day. And I'm, I'll be honest, like I'm not religious with it or perfect with it or anything like that, but it's nice sometimes just to document or to, I don't know, write down some of those milestones and then go back and reflect and be like, wow, you know, this is the day my you know son learned to walk or that my daughter for the first time, you know, used her fork properly or whatever, you know, and it kind of makes some of those like mundane things like today, for example, my son Griffin held a little baby frog that was out in the wild and he was so scared to do it and all of his friends were doing it and they were like, you know, picking up frogs like it was like a piece of, you know, anything. They just had no fear and my son was so scared, so scared and he finally like broke through that fear and he picked up a little baby frog and he was so proud of himself and so excited and so like that's a little memory I can write down for today and it seems so silly but like those are the moments, the richness that you can look back on and be like, wow, you know, we got through this. Like we not only got through this, but there was a lot of magic and a lot of um, wonderful moments and beauty and, um, you know, just miraculous things that happen in very ordinary ways. And I think from my personal experience of having uh, Leo, being present is so important. And I can imagine that being present during your pregnancy and then actually, you know, your birth and then the years after that. But I think with children, for me, the more present I am with him, the more joy I feel within. And, you know, we've all got to-do lists and businesses and things that we've got to do. But in that moment, nothing else matters more than just being fully there and being present with him and letting go of my expectations and letting go of the way I think my day should be unfolding. And, and you know, a lot of women getting, letting go of the way that their birth should be and just being there, all there, fully there in the moment. I feel like whether you're in the pregnancy, I mean, whether whether you're about to give birth or whether you're just playing with your children, like presence is absolute key. Mm -hmm. No, that's absolutely right. And the less you are in that space, the more suffering. And so there are so many times where it's like, we just have to surrender. Like I just have to surrender my plans, my agenda, my idea of what it should be. And we, I do not do it even close to perfectly. Um, but 
when I do, it's so joyful, so much more peaceful. Everyone is in such a better place and I'm enjoying it, you know, but when I resisted and resisted and resisted, that's where the suffering comes in for me. So absolutely expectations and resistance and holding on with white knuckle grip, that is when we suffer and we don't have to suffer. You know, we don't. It doesn't have to be part of our reality. And like we mentioned before, I believe that education is absolute key. And even if you're not even thinking about having a baby anytime soon, this information and the information in your book is so vital because all women need to have humming hormones. And pregnancy is a result of happy humming hormones. So what are three things that women can do today to get their hormones humming along smoothly? That's a good question. Um, Well, first, of course, it always comes down to diet. So reducing a lot of inflammatory processed junk food, sugar, white flour, um, you know, just quick carbs, sugary drinks, all that kind of junk, just getting that out of the diet is huge. Um, eating, you know, some superfoods for women and just for hormones like pomegranates and, you know, wild caught salmon and certain nuts and seeds and, um, green drinks. Like I think just like juicing, you know, getting, just getting a lot of nice vegetables and fruits in your day can be great. Um, and, you know, getting some high quality, I know some people don't do dairy, but just being sure you're getting good sources of calcium, um, good omega threes, things like that. So of course your diet, you know, and I think I've got a post about that, like the perfect pregnancy diet, getting lots of color into your diet too. So you're getting a lot of those phytonutrients. Um, and you can look up, there's conception diets. There's, you know, certain foods that are really powerful for that, but diet of course is always foundational. Then I would say like sleep, um, is huge for us as women, um, in terms of just our home hormones and our stress levels and balance. So that's another window into our health. If we're having a hard time falling asleep, if we're waking up at three in the morning, if we're waking up at five in the morning, you know, all those are clues of different things that are going on. So you want to have solid eight, you know, even to nine hours of sleep at night. Um, so some things that can help you do that is one sleeping in a completely dark room to the point where you can't even see your hand in front of your face. So the darker, the better. Um, that's kind of how we're designed to sleep is in darkness. Also to have your room be cool. Um, that just supports all kind of our hormones, a cascade of things that also even can help with weight management, believe it or not. Um, also looking at your exposure to blue light and electronics and devices and stuff like that. So a good rule of thumb is like, if you can cut off the cell phone usage at 8 PM, if possible, or if you still use it using things like flux or different things to dim the screens, to reduce that blue light, because that blue light is very stimulating and it interferes with the melatonin production in our bodies, which is super important for helping us induce sleep and get into that drowsy state and stay in a good place when we're sleeping. Uh, so reducing your, um, you know, TV watching or getting like blue blocker glasses. I don't know if you've ever seen those. I know Bren Greenfield, if you're a fan, I know you guys are friends, wears them. In fact, I went to a conference once and I saw him and he was wearing his glasses at night. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is classic. Yeah, we wear ours all the time. We wear them on the planes in the airport. Like we are always wearing them and we love them. Yeah. I mean, you feel better. My husband thought I was ridiculous when I first got them because I got the really ugly, like, construction workers are like $6 on Amazon. I mean, they were like very, they just didn't look that good, first of all, but they worked, you know? And he, so anyways, he thought I was ridiculous, but he was having trouble with his sleep. And so I'm like, and he, you know, cause at night he does his Kindle, you know, um, and it's a lot, it's a certain type that doesn't have as much blue light, but I told him, I'm like, that is disrupting your sleep. Cause as soon as you got that is when you've had issues. So I'm like, just wear my glasses one night while you're reading it. So anyway, he did. And sure enough, his sleep like totally improved. So now he's got him. He's like more <laughs> religious about him than I am. So I love that. But anyway, so you can wear those blue blockers. And, you know, and again, to me, I'm like, that's like the gentle cesarean, like little hacks, you know, because we live in this modern, very technological world. How can we manage it in a way that supports our DNA and our biology? 
Um, and just, you know, just trying to wind down at night, getting into some routines, drinking some tea, taking baths, things like that. So you sleep well, because that really, you know, some people say that melatonin is the master hormone, which is going to influence all the other hormones, including our sex hormones, obviously. Um, another thing I find really helpful for women is first thing in the morning to have a rich protein or protein and fat meal. Um, and less on the carbs. And even if they're healthy carbs, I find that it, that really helps to stabilize blood sugar levels and just keep you in a good place, like for your lunch and your dinner. And then as the day goes on, you can have more carbs. And some women just intuitively do this anyway. But um, there are some great studies that have come out around just adrenal function and how it's more supported with like a protein kind of fat type meal for the first meal of the day. So that's just another little tip. Um, so I'd say, so diet, sleep, um, look at their period. That is a huge, you know, indicator of things. If it's not in a good place, go see, a, you know, a naturopath or a holistic doctor to get you balanced. Um, one supplement I really love in terms of like estrogen dominance and things like that is a broccoli seed um, extract. So it's like when a broccoli seed is sprouted, it releases these certain compounds that are really great for detoxifying bad estrogens. And it really can help regulate um, mom's periods and just reduce any kind of, you know, um, estrogen dominant like symptoms. Um, there's other supplements that can help with that too, but it's the same idea of those cruciferous vegetables being really helpful for imbalance um, with those types of things. So that'd be another thing. Um, not overdoing it with exercise. I think being active and definitely moving your body and doing some cardio and weight training is great, but just watch like the super stressful exercising, you know, um, because that also can be hard on our home hormonal balance in terms of wanting to have a baby, you know what I mean? And, and preparing the body for that, um, massive biological process. And then the last thing is, you know, if you are going to get pregnant, let's say you're like, okay, in six months or three months or whatever, boosting those superfoods, eating, you know, eggs and, you know, wild caught fish and fish eggs and good fats and um, lots of fruits and veggies and all that type of stuff. Just giving yourself a great foundation. Some women even take like a food-based prenatal before they even try getting pregnant just to boost their micronutrient levels um, so that their body is just in a great place as they walk into pregnancy. Um, you could even do some targeted liver work because your liver really works a lot when you're pregnant processing all these hormones. So, you know, castor oil packs, um, milk thistle, you can do the tea or different tinctures are great. Um, and just give your liver some love, you know, before you walk into pregnancy so that it's just in a good shape as it's having to deal with more um, hormones and stuff like that. So mm, they're all great tips. Thank you so much. I would now love to hear one thing that you're currently working on or would like to improve within yourself at the moment. Is there anything that you've got that you're really working on? That's a great question. Um, I'm really working on now, I'm in a place right now where, like I just said earlier, my daughter now is three and she, more importantly, because an age is just a number, she's at a place where she's, she's just in a good place. And my son is in a good place. And so for the first time for the, in the last seven years, I'm looking inward again more. And I'm like, oh my gosh, now this is a time for me. And so things that I'm working on is just my fitness. Like I walk a lot um, and I do Pilates with my husband three days a week, but I want to get into weight training. So we're going to be signing up for this health club. And I'm like, okay, I'm going twice a week, whether I like it or not, because it's time for me to do that. So that's something I'm definitely looking into. Um, also just practicing more regular detoxification. So we have a sauna. Um, I have a big, nice, lovely bath. Um, I've got a fascia blaster. I have these different tools. And so I've been using them now more consistently because before, like, I mean, when my kids are getting up at 6 a.m. and I'm having to do this and I'm changing diapers, and, you know, when you're in that really hard baby stage, it's harder to do those types of things. But now I'm in a place where I can. And so I've been really enjoying that. And so just bumping all of that up, even my oral care, like I listened to your interview about taking care of your gums and all the different essential oils. So I've been looking into to that. And so it's actually been kind of fun, you know, just to kind of up my game on all levels. And, um, 
And I'm also wanting to do a little bit more of some gut healing. So, you know, lots of different things, but I think the overall theme is just taking care of myself better, you know, because I have now more time to do that instead of just keeping it. I think before I was just so in the basics, you know, but now I can do more of the thriving and the um, really growing and the stretching that I couldn't do before. Beautiful. We'll have fun with it. Let's pretend that you have a magic wand and you could put one book in the school curriculum of every single high school around the world. Now, besides your book, because that's a given, that's already in the curriculum, let's pretend. What is one book that you would recommend? Oh my gosh, that's such a great question. I know it's so hard too. I know, I know. (laughs) Yeah. I would say... um, you know, something about, and I don't know what the book necessarily would be. Um, Louise L. Hay actually wrote a book for kids around this type of topic, but just something that just sends the message that they are loved, that they are, that they have a special, that they have special gifts to share with the world. Um, I don't know. I'm such, I love, like, I feel such a connection to God. And I just think of the way God loves me. And I can sometimes see and with his eyes of how much God loves everyone. And so just if kids can know that, you know what I mean? That they are precious, that they are beloved, that they are born with a purpose and that um, they have gifts to share with the world, you know, that they're not a nuisance, that they're not a pain in the butt, that they're not, you know, and, but they have gifts to share with the world and we can't wait to see what those are. And to, so some kind of book that has that message. I don't know if there, I'm sure there's books out there that are like that. I just pour that into my children as much as I can, but I know that there's books out there that talk that way and speak that way to children and get them excited about who they are and what their gifts are and that discovery of, you know, their maturation. So I don't think they hear that enough in school, you know? That they- no. They don't. They don't. And we tell our little boy all the time. But uh, you pretty much described my book, Mastering Your Mean Girl, which is all about mastering that inner voice inside your head and uh, reminding you that you are a unique gift and your responsibility is to share that with the world. So, um, yeah, I'll have to send you a copy so you can have a read. I would love that. <laughs> I'd love it. So, let's talk about now how your day looks. Do you have a morning routine? How do you prime yourself for a successful day? I love hearing what people do. So, could you share some of the things that you do? Sure. Uh, so, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, if we're getting real tactical, my husband and I do Pilates for the first half hour. Like we get up and we just do it. It's like a little like thing on our um, laptop. And so that's always awesome because just having a partner and we just find it really helps our back, our posture, our core. Um, So that's one thing we do. Um, I also, look, when I get up, I oil pull. I'm a huge oil puller. So um, I do that. And basically, when my kids get up, this is, see, right now we're in summer. So when they get up, they get to watch screen time for like the first hour of their day, which I know naughty me, but it gives me that time to have the space to have, you know, do some self care things. Um, and then once that hour is over, then we're done and we engage in our day and do our things. So um, I like to oil pull, um, definitely do that, straight my tongue. Um, and then do some kind of exercise, whether, whether that's Pilates with my husband, whether I'm going to start going to this gym to do weight training, but I like to get it done early in the day because then it's done and, you know, we're good to go. Um, and then a couple days a week, I do work. Like I work part-time. So on the days that I do work, um, you know, I'm doing blog posts. I'm working on right now. I'm working on an ebook for, um, hair, like, you know, cause a lot of women, after you give birth, you can lose a lot of hair. And some women struggle with balding and receding hairlines and different things like that. So it's all about just like growing thick, you know, naturally um, growing thicker hair and just kind of helping to rebuild your hair if you've had some hair loss. So research, you know, writing, um, things like that. I also have that birth. um, We do a a natural birth course. So, So writing in the Facebook groups, connecting with moms, getting back to people. So just working, you know, those types of things on the days that I do work on the days that I don't work, you know, I'm with my kids. So we'll go to the beach. We love going to the beach. Um, so we'll do that. We'll go to the library. We'll do a play date with friends. 
Um, and then really the meals, a lot of things focus around meals because I do three meals from scratch every day. So in the mornings we do big smoothies and this is really my husband's specialty. And it's like, he puts, oh my gosh, like the cream puts carrots, you know, green peas, berries, you know, anything you can imagine. That's like a superfood, avocado, different hemp seeds, different things like that and blends it all up and feeds it out to the family. So we have that, um, or I'll have my eggs if I want more protein and stuff like that, or I'll add in some protein powder. And, um, and then, so then basically it's really centered around mealtime. So then for lunch, we come home, you know, I'm making the meals and then um, my daughter still naps so she'll go down and then playing more with the kids. Or if I'm working that day, I'll work a little bit more. Um, and we actually have a treadmill desk. So I try to, I really work hard to get the 10,000 steps in a day through the treadmill desk, which makes it really easy. Or I'll just do some laps around our neighborhood to be sure I'm just moving my body. And then we come together for dinner and, um, you know, eat a healthy meal. And, and then it's really about getting the kids to bed. So reading them stories, brushing teeth. And then my husband and I get like an hour or maybe an hour or two to ourselves. So I would say a couple times a week, we'll watch a show. And then the other couple times a week, I'm taking a hot bath with, you know, magnesium salts or doing a sauna. I actually do my saunas at night, which is probably, I don't know if that's the greatest idea, but it, it actually relaxes me. So I'll do that. And then take a rinse afterwards. So I try to do, you know, mix it up. And then sometimes even if I'm watching a show, I can do like a castor oil pack or, you know, different things to help my body, um, even when I'm just watching a show. So Hmm. pretty simple life. Sounds good. I'd love to hear now, what are three things you're most recently grateful for? Oh, I think the opportunity to travel. We talked about this before we got on this podcast. Uh, we just got back from a cruise and we traveled throughout um, kind of like the Mediterranean, the Southern Mediterranean countries and just being able to immerse myself in other cultures, be able to speak Spanish. And oh, I just was in heaven and I just felt so grateful that I had the opportunity to do that with my family. So I love to travel and just feel really blessed to be able to, um, to do that. The other thing is just where we lived, you know, it's so interesting. You know, we went to Nice and to Naples and some of the most gorgeous cities and the, you know, just beautiful waters and awesome cuisine and stuff like that. And yet I, it also made me love where I live. And I was so grateful for that because it can be easy to get lost. You know what I mean? Get so, you can romanticize it and it can be so awesome to be on vacation. Sometimes you're like, oh, I just wish I lived there. And I really didn't feel that way. Um, So I'm super grateful for where we live. It's a small little beach town. I can literally get to the beach and be in the beautiful water and walk along the beach and ground and just feel connected to the earth and go hiking. And so I just feel very grateful that I get to live in such a beautiful place um, and with warm weather coming from Chicago that was very cold in the winter. So that's another thing I'm really grateful for. And then I would say, um, of course, my children always, um, but also just a relationship with my husband. I think that's also the place that we're in. We've been able to exhale and look up and be like, hey, you, Um, because we haven't, you know, we've been so into the parenting mode. Um, that we're now kind of in this really uh, kind of in an enjoyment place where we get to have a little bit more freedom, um, have more time together, be able to have go out more on dates and different things. Um, or even just when we're in the home, because our kids now play together so well, we have these like blocks of time where we can just connect and hang and be together. And it's not just about work. It's just about, you know, being partners. So I'm very grateful for him and, God gave me a good one. So I'm grateful for that. (laughs) And what is one of the most important things that we can do for our health? Just one thing. Give up sugar. Mm -hmm. Amen. What about one thing that we can do for more wealth in our life? And when I say wealth, I mean all areas of your life. I would say like, to me, you know, to me, abundance um, and kind of practicing abundance is a lot about gratitude, a lot about um, pouring out, you know what I mean? And, you know, for example, if someone that you love or whatever, you know, gets this really awesome job deal or they get, you know, they're pregnant with twins or, you know, these wonderful things that happen in other people's life. I think many, many years ago, I would get jealous or I would feel like, oh, is that ever going to happen for me? Or, you know, and kind of 
um, it would kind of bring me inward instead of outward. And so to me, abundance and um, prosperity is about celebrating that for other people and being in joy and be like, Oh my gosh, that's so awesome. And really just feeling that for that person. And I, for me living in that way brings in more abundance, you know, because it's just an open heart and open mind. It's believing that there's enough knowing that, that, um, you know, to me again, cause I, my faith is really important to me that God doesn't play favorites, that God loves all of us, that this is, just part of who he is um, and that goodness and that celebration and that connectedness. So that to me is how I think you can increase your abundance is just by celebrating other people's successes, celebrating other people's abundance, um, finding the gratitude, even in hard things and living it with that mindset to me just attracts more abundance basically. So Mm, I, couldn't agree more. And what is one of the most important things that we could do for love, for more love in the world and more self-love? I think just getting to know your neighbor, you know, getting to know the people that are around you and whether it's the mailman or, you know, your neighbor, your little neighbor or the person at the grocery store, Loving well where you're planted, basically. Loving your children well, loving your husband well. Um, and being present. You know, you talked a lot about, about that. It's just seeing, instead of like, you know, you go to the post office, you're like, I just want to mail this thing. I want to get out of this line. I want to be home, you know. Encountering the person that's on the other end and seeing them, you know, and honoring them and, you know, honoring what their journey is and what their role and is in life and stuff like that. So that to me brings love, you know, into the room, so to speak. And I think also another thing is if there's certain things that scare me or certain people or certain situations, trying to understand and like, you know, they would say walk in another person's shoe, but just trying to understand that person more or that belief system or that instead of being scared of it, if that makes sense. Um, That also I think is huge into bringing love and keeping that love instead of getting into fear or, um, you know, separation and stuff like that. So beautiful advice. I absolutely love that so much. And you've inspired me and I'm going to get to know my neighbors more. I think it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, finally, I would like to ask you one last question. What can I personally and the listeners do to serve you today? (laughs) <laughs> wow. Um, just be who they are in the world. Be who you are in the world. That to me is how you serve me best, serve the world best. It's just being you because you have special gifts. You have um, you were created for a purpose. And so living in that blesses me. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, we can definitely do that. Thank you so much, Genevieve. This has been absolutely amazing and so informative. And I just love how much joy and light you bring to this topic. And I just want to encourage everyone to check out the show notes because we'll link to your book. We'll link to all of your hilarious YouTube videos because they just had me in stitches. I'm just so grateful that you're out there blazing the trail for natural birth. And I'm just so grateful to have come across you and your work and cannot recommend your book enough. So um, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Melissa, so much. It was a pleasure to meet you. I'm so grateful that Ben brought us together and keep me posted. I love the work that you're doing in your world. And um, I started following you on Instagram and keep me posted, you know, on your journey too. So, um, it'll be fun to watch you continue to unfold. And if you, you know, when you're ready to have your, expand your family, how that journey will go for you. So I'm here to support you. Oh, thank you so much. What a beautiful soul, so full of wisdom and knowledge and just such a lovely person. What a beautiful, beautiful woman. 
There's so much great information in her book, even if you aren't thinking about having a baby anytime soon and you just want to get your hormones back online or want them to hum along smoothly, the information is for all women. And if you got a lot out of today's episode, please subscribe and leave me a five-star review because that means that we can inspire even more people together. And don't forget to tell me on Twitter who you would like me to interview and make sure you tag me at Mel underscore Ambrosini and the person you want me to interview using the hashtag the Melissa Ambrosini show. And for everything that we mention in today's episode, you can check out in the show notes and that is at melissaambrosini.com forward slash 34. And you can also check out all my other amazing episodes there too. Thank you so much for being here, for wanting to be the best version of yourself possible and for showing up today for you. You seriously rock. Now, if there is someone in your life that you can think of would really benefit from this episode, please forward it, share it with them right now. Text it to them, do whatever you have to do to get it in front of them. And until next time, don't forget that love is sexy, healthy is liberating, and wealthy isn't a dirty word.